Yes. Others? Anything up there strike you as? I love the uh, one, you have to try new things. And, uh, and it comes from self-reflection. So every time I think, what can I do better? And I ask the student, give me feedback. This is your class. Uh, what can I do better? And then when we try things. Uh, you told the students it's their class? Yeah. You told them that? I actually thank them for paying for my salary. <laughs> <laughs> I give them the invoices because it's exciting money and, and so, but yes, it's their class and uh, you know, I try to stay away from pushing them to the testing center and pull them to into learning. Hmm. And uh, whenever I try something new, I'm, I'm <laughs> so excited because what they produce is so much better than I could ever imagine. And I said, oh wow. They went far beyond. Some of the leadership bedtime story books that my students are writing this semester, this is the new thing I'm trying. Unbelievable. So I could have bought stock in Kleenex company because they are so good. And just <laughs> wait till they are done. But it's, it's exciting for me. One of her colleagues that sat through the seminar we did stopped me and he said, I've been thinking for a long time about this thing to try, but I've been scared. Mm -hmm. yeah, but because of class, I'm doing it. Here's what's happening. He was just on fire. Why was he on fire? Well, I was going to comment. Oh, I think uh, we know why <laughs> You're always one step ahead of us. Um, from that first, you know, I'm, on the, I'm on the university assessment committee, and is Rose here? But according, you know, from apparently, it's for a student's perspective, it's all about assessment. If they're going to be assessed on something, they'll do it. That's their motivation. That's, that's one way of thinking about it, right? And so from the first quote, I like the idea that they want to do it even if there is no grade. And so what I tell my students is that the best compliment I get from them is when they're, like you just said, when your student's talking about your class, about what you've discussed, outside of a class context, because that means they're applying the knowledge. It's, they're making, they're taking it into themselves. They're making it useful for their daily functioning. Like food, that's kind of a metaphor. You, you're consuming ideas and you're making use of them for your daily functioning. You're not just memorizing this for the test or, or doing it, you know, just for the here and now, this is something that you're applying and that you can take with you. Thank so I like that idea, but I don't know, it, it's, hard, it's hard to get to that point. Ah, thank you. It's hard to get to this point. If I put those four things together, what do you see? I see a dynamic system, not a static system. I see an emergent system. And it's hard to get there. I can't structure it. Uh, yes? One of the things that I took from what Wayne was saying, I love that she said, um, talk about uh, trying something, and there's fear of trying. Now she, she, she's not talking about someone else. The first time they try it, and they feel this fear to do it. But then if you notice when she was talking, and she said, I'm going to try something new, and I had this confidence, and I went in, and it was just great. I was more touched by that than anything she said, because for me, it was, I think we all end up living in the fear of trying it, and maybe it has failed. I bet she's had failures once in a while. I don't know, maybe. Probably not. <laughs> but, but to try again. But at one point, when you finally settle that fear to try, and you have success, and your confidence level blows up, and so pretty soon the fear goes away. And you're just, I love that. I can watch the world. What comes to my mind as you say that is a story I shared with someone, I think, last night. But we have a state pres president, former state president, who's been a CEO, mission president, temple president, state president, and not just a state president, he's a hero to the people because he was such a master teacher incredibly vulnerable, authentic, present. People just worship him. The current state president said to me, 
I'd like you to be the stake Sunday school president. Okay, what do you want? Well, I want you to transform teaching in the stake. Not just in Sunday school, in the society, primary. I want you to transform it, because I think the church is going to do something next year. Um, okay, president, how should we do that? He said, I don't have the slightest idea. Just start doing stuff and we'll get revelation. Remember the first quote? So I called this former state president, this is my first counselor, and I called this young doctor, brilliant young doctor. We made a round of the woods, and the doctor stood up as a facilitator and facilitated Sunday school discussions. At first, he was a little clumsy, but after a couple of wards, he did quite well. We're sitting in the Sunday school presidency meeting, and um, I said, Adam, that was so impressive, the growth that took place. He said, thank you. My first counselor said, yeah, I was really impressed. I could never do that. Adam looked at him and said, oh, well, it's funny you say that, because I had the impression you should do it this time. He said, no, 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 I could never. I said, Tom, I had the same impression. And all of a sudden, we have a panicked former state president. He says, I can't, I can't, I don't know how to ask questions. And this guy's a master teacher. I said to him, Tom, I think you have to be a fool for Christ. You've got to model, because that's the fear everybody in the state has. And you could just see him turning pale. And, All right. And then a week of agony. We went to the first ward con conference. He stood up and for 35 minutes told a powerful story, asked one question and sat down. And I said to the people, how was the lesson? They said, that was a great lesson. We love that story. I said, oh, that was only lesson one. You missed lesson two. Lesson two is probably the most powerful lesson you've ever had. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, what do you think of Tom Nielsen? Oh, we love him. He's so this, he's so that, and, you know, just a little love fest. I said, let me tell you a story that happened in that office over there the other night. When a terrified man said, I can't do it. I'll look like a fool. But he just came here and did it. What's that tell you about Tom Nielsen? that for the Lord, he's willing to change, even if it's embarrassing. So we went to the next place, 25 minutes and a couple questions. By the end of the circle, he was still kind of stumbling through. And then we had a Relief Society event. I'm standing and these sisters are running up saying, guess what just happened in there? Tom did it and he was great. His style changed. The excuse that he hears all the time. I can't do this. It's not my style. It's not my personality. Can't change that. Well, here's a man who learned his way into come follow me. Who knew he couldn't do it. Okay. Now, next uh, segment here. Um, oh, let me say one other thing about this. These are Gentiles. Think about it. What a wonderful word. Gentiles. These are Gentiles. Creating Zion in a public classroom. Why can Gentiles do it and Latter-day Saints not do it? What a stunning thing to think about. Okay, the radical view. This is a book I put up here because I do not want you to read this book. <laughs> this book is the most depressing book I've ever read. First two chapters are about genetics and in detail description of how you are totally programmed by your genetics. And those genes don't care much about you. All they want is for you to reproduce as much as possible and live as long as possible. Other than that, they don't care much about you. The next set of chapters are about culture. An in-depth description of the power of culture and how you are programmed by your culture. It is so depressing. I tried to put this book down, actually. <laughs> he gets to the last chapter, he says an interesting thing. The resolution, look at life as something to be created. Does that sound like a prophet named Lehi? To act and not be acted upon. 
Laman and Lemuel never left Jerusalem. Interface programming with a purpose that really matters, that leads to deep meaning. Now, here are um, six words, synonyms for teaching, that I looked up in the dictionary. Please read them and tell me what they have in common. Every one of those definitions is teacher-centric. I'm acting on something. See this object here? I'm acting on it. It. Thanks. <laughs> Just hoping that. Um, now, here's the point. You and I are culturally programmed. If you've got some musical talent and you practice for 10,000 hours, what happens? You go to Carnegie Hall. What if you do 9,000 hours? You do gigs in the local bar room, right? There's research that says 10,000 hours is a magic number. By the time you graduated from college, you spent 15,000 hours doing something. What was it? What was it? I spent 15,000 hours being trained to be an object. <laughs> How can we overcome that? That's the definition of teaching. Would you try to come follow me? Is it a surprise that the people can't do it? You know, Lee said it's a miracle what we've accomplished. My reaction was, I'm not so sure yet. 35 years ago, we did it once before. We changed the name of MIA, we put in shadow leadership, all the same principles. And what, six, seven years later, we quietly pulled the program. I remember one of the bishops in our state saying, well, we had the higher law, and now we've been given the lower law. My mission president was on that committee. He said, the kids were fine. The adults couldn't do it. It was chaos. Um, that's powerful enculturation. We're trying to fight a battle that's enormously difficult because we know the teachings about you and I being an expert. One of the participants in the seminar said, I was in graduate school, you know what that's like. Then they gave me a piece of paper and told me I was a human being. I came here and I taught my first class and they were writing down what I said. Whoa! How's that for a change in life? They're writing down what I said. That's a powerful ego massage. This man has a huge battle in front of him. Now, most of you, I think of, is that right, Chad? Most of them have done Breakfast. Well, in fairness to the college report, I think we all have two children. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He's, he's been getting beat up all day long, so he's used to it by now. Too, that morning. Collective intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I know a number of you have been in this book. Well, the first week I was here, Chad asked me to, to facilitate a breakfast. Um, and so I read the chapters, and I pulled out this paragraph. So he's looking at great college professors, not ordinary ones, great ones, and he says, what begins to emerge is a model of education in which learners do not do more than accumulate information. They undergo deep-seated changes, transformations that affect both the habits of the heart and mind and the capacity for continued growth. So you look at the best college professors and this model <coughs> emerges. Now it just so happened, that we had just sent off a manuscript to the publisher, it would be out in June, on the interviews with these public school teachers. If I could have plagiarized those words, I would have, because that's exactly what we found with the public school teachers. Now, here's your next exercise. Uh, under your chair, I think Dave, were they under the, oh, okay. Anyway, they're passing out a couple pages. On the first page, it looks like this. 
And what I did is took the Bain book and took those two chapters and I put them into two perspectives. On the next page, it looks like this. And this is from the book we did on the, the public school teachers. And what I'd like you to do is to look at those individually for a minute. I'd like you then to name these two paradigms or perspectives. Put a name on them. Write one sentence that describes each paradigm. And then I'd like you to tackle this incredibly challenging question. Suggest a strategy for helping teachers integrate and utilize both paradigms. The word both is crucial. All right? So if you take a minute individually, read those two pages, the two paradigms, the one from the Bain book, one from the public school teachers, and then these three things. Name the two paradigms. Describe each one in a single sentence. Suggest a strategy for helping teachers integrate and utilize both paradigms. All right? I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. Okay, who's got a couple of names? Who's going to name these perspectives? It's, uh, um, the first one is me most of the time. The second one is me sometime. Me most of the time versus me sometime. <laughs> Sister Wazi. Contact based versus explorative. Explorative content. Me sometimes, me a little time. What else? Teaching to follow and teaching to teach. Teaching to follow, teaching to teach. teach. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Second one's about becoming. Okay. All right. Um, describe the first one in a sentence. <coughs> That's a short sentence. It's, it's boring. <laughs> 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 
Frozen in time, boring, okay. Don't we have anything good to say about that first one? Because I think there are some good things to say about it, right? <laughs> okay. Ah, oh, so it creates a structure, and we need structure. Thank you. There's some good. Number one is the dominant paradigm has brought us, you could argue, much of the advancement and the improvement in our lives and our societies. Rocket fuel, airplanes, and the internet, and all of this stuff has come out of people who have gone through an education system largely founded on this paradigm. Well, I want a wonderful statement. We've had huge human payoffs because of that paradigm. Is it quite possible because we have such a structured way of thinking and doing everything that we possibly haven't achieved all the potential that we could have much earlier? Ah, okay. So there's an interesting counterbalance to the notion. But maybe there's more potential. Okay. How about just thinking, looking at it as teaching, teaching as a science versus teaching as an art? Okay. And from that perspective, how do you integrate both so that you come up to the best? Very interesting. Oh, so that. Um, yeah, I think one could be fun and exciting because it's it's you know the profession itself in, in terms of of the end result and even the process itself could be extremely fun and exciting because the learning is taking. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to Brad. steal. Uh, somebody up here said it. Um, I, I, paradigm one is highly standardized. Mm -hmm. And because it's highly standardized, and we mentioned the structure, it's reproducible. Mm. To where you can easily take it from one person, give it to another person, and you can pretty much expect what the outcomes are going to be from it. Whereas I don't think paradigm two necessarily that way. I'm not sure if it's, it's different somehow. reproducible. Yeah. It's different somehow. Yeah. On my mission, um, I have something similar to this kind of point this out, which is I sat down with Elder Sobrowski one on one once and um, the form of the 70s. <coughs> and we were talking about the success of my mission and different levels I was at. And I'd say the level one um, would be kind of going through the motions um, and not following to the full intent kind of there. But level two, um, when the most success is happening, or the, the potential that it could have been is going through all the motions full-heartedly and expanding and innovating. And um, it's just based upon what we really want and what we're reaching out to the So you're telling me that a missionary could go on his mission and go through the motion? And opposed to that, a missionary could do what? He could be innovative and follow everything to the guidelines and never stop achieving great success. Because the problem I was having at one point in my time on a mission before I met with Elder Sobrowski, I was achieving really good success according to the numbers on the mission. I was having more baptisms than a lot of people. And then times where I followed everything through the tea, I was, wasn't really getting that in baptisms. And then he pointed out, he says, what happens if in those areas that you weren't doing everything you're supposed to and you're having all that success, how much success could you have had? And so it points out to us that in, like in this situation, we're achieving great success and great things are happening with going through the motions in the classroom. But what could we really be achieving if we go that extra mile? Thank you very, very much. What an interesting thought. In 2006, Elder Ballard said to the mission presidents in the MTC, you'll get some missionaries who become converted to conversion. And once you get them, you can put them in any area in the mission and baptisms will happen. It's such an interesting claim. It's so hard for me to believe. Um, 
Okay, this is Parker Palmer. Paradoxical thinking requires that we embrace a view of the world in which opposites are joined so that we can see the world clearly and see it whole. Such a view is characterized by either flinty-eyed realism or dewy-eyed romanticism, but rather creative synthesis of the two. You might call that intelligent optimism. The result is a world more complex and confusing uh, than one made simple by either or thought. When we think things together, we reclaim the life force in the world, in our students, and in ourselves. There was a scholar at Harvard who studied innovative breakthroughs. The only thing he would look at were award-winning breakthroughs in all different disciplines. And when he was done, he said the one commonality was Janusian insight. Janus was the god with multiple faces, so she could look this way and this way. And, he could. Um, and at the heart of every breakthrough was a Janusian insight. He said, Einstein, for example, said, the happiest thought of my life was when I conceived of motion and rest operating simultaneously. So I go up on the roof, I drop an apple, I drop my wallet, in relation to the roof, they're moving, in relation to each other, they're at rest. From that seed thought came all of relativity. He said you could find it in music, you could find it in English, you could find it everywhere. Um, please look at the following slide I put up. I'd just like you to stare at it for 60 seconds or so. And then whatever impression comes to you, the most important insight that comes to you, whatever it might be, would you just record it? Complex slide. Just stare at it for a while. Whatever insight comes, write it down. Okay, would someone share what you're writing or have written? Yes, ma'am. Opportunities are equal. Okay. Yeah. They both fill up needs and they are both and everything. and everything is used. What do you mean everything is used? Reminds me of a phrase, and there were no poor among them. Hmm. Other insights? What'd you write down? Yes, sir. Um, I, I uh, initially thought it was some sort of personality color thing because of the, the color of the orientation, but as I looked at it more, um, the thoughts that I had was that uh, as we are drawn out of our own area of comfort, uh, then collectively, teacher and student both come together and meet in the middle. I allow my goals, accountability, vision, and things that I might have for the class, I allow the student to have a more engaged process in that. And likewise, if I'm drawn into their relationships and the support and respect for them and so forth, then we meet in the middle and collectively have a greater experience. All of a sudden, we're equals. The hierarchy becomes latent, because I'm still the teacher, and I can step back in any moment and say, all right, let's fix this. I can take authority. But when we're in that space, in that high learning space, I think of a nurse who said to me, I was on a major research project. We had doctors, engineers, all these people in the room. She said, but when I walked in that room in the morning, we all took our hats off. There were no engineers, no doctors, no nurses. We were equals. Pursuing a common purpose, learning together. And you're suggesting that that's possible with students in the classroom? That's pretty radical stuff. So like going back to your title about empowering, learning to empower. Yes. You learn to empower somebody else. And you end up empowering them in the end. You come to a space where both of you are empowered equally. And I think that's what it's trying to look at. So if you let that process take its natural course and actually end up empowering each other, Each other. You both be in an space 
I have an object over here. Remember my object? He's getting used to this. Um, that's a disempowering relationship. When he's my equal, whoa, that's a highly empowering relationship. We did 20 years of research on empowerment. Empowered people have a sense of autonomy. What's the gospel word? Agency. They have a sense of impact, competence, and meaning. Can I relate to him in a way he's constantly growing in agency, capacity? Think of Elder Goldberg. It's a different model. 